Hey everyone, this is Nick from the Nth Review. I've been getting a lot of questions and requests about my process and how I make my hours-long video essays about games, my big-ass game reviews. And uh, they've become pretty popular recently. Not, not mine, just mine, but video essays altogether. And so while this isn't prescriptive of how you make a three-hour video essay, but more how I make my three-hour video essays. Uh, I decided that I would just share my process kind of end-to-end and just kind of explain all the steps that I go through. I've got a template for how I do things, uh, which is how I'm able to get them out in a reasonable time frame. So I figured I would share them with you because I'm obviously not popular enough to be on Nebula, where I could just hide this behind a paywall or something and make lots of money that way. I'm just gonna have to make lots of money by you watching this to the very end of the video and not skipping any ads or having an ad blocker. I don't care. Do what you want. Before I go into the process, I do want to talk about uh, the hardware uh, that I'm using. So, first off, this is running on a Windows 10 PC that I built six years ago. Uh, for like 16 1700 bucks so this was like a close to top end not bleeding edge and I'm gonna put the specs over here so that you can kind of see uh, where this machine comes from obviously I would love to have a more powerful machine I can watch footage in real time but like I don't know like half resolution and uh, it does take me a number of hours to render which we'll talk about later. So that's on a Windows 10 desktop. I have two monitors. This one over here that you can't see, I'll put up a thing here, is a 4K monitor. This is where I do primary uh, editing, productivity, stuff like that. And then over here where I'm reading off the outline and this is where I usually read my script, this is a 2K slightly older uh, monitor. And uh, they're both Asus. Um, they've served me very well. And if I could have a third monitor, uh, I would totally would. <laughs> or I could just get one of those 49-inch Odysseys uh, and do that. Uh, here, as you can see, I have a Blue Yeti uh, Snowball microphone uh, that I borrowed from a friend and then never gave back. Uh, this has served me well. I think I've had this ever since the third Nth review. The first two, I, I believe it's the first two. Um, I was using a headset, which is why it sounds like a So, and if you go back to those earliest, it's fun going back to the earliest ones and seeing how things have changed. Uh, I would love to eventually go with the whole standalone mixer plugged by USB and then have this be an XLR mic and uh, be cleaner and have all the amp, uh, preampage and all that fun stuff. That's kind of like a dream goal. Uh, but obviously that costs. There's this thing where like they've kind of, the economics has worked out in such a way where you can get a lot of really decent stuff that gets you 80% of the way there for relatively cheap. But if you want to make that leap to the, that 90%, uh, you have to pay substantially more. And that's where I'm at with a lot of stuff. For example, this camera right here is the front facing camera of a Pixel 4. Yeah, it's just a Pixel 4 smartphone. It's running Droid Cam, and that's feeding into OBS right now. And so uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a second. I have a tripod. The phone is on a tripod, just a small standalone tripod. And I have a ring light. Uh, that was, hang on. Yeah, so it's a tripod and a ring light. And uh, you can get this in a sun pack. This is what you came for. This is the quality content you are enjoying at this moment. Um, I have some strip lighting along the wall. The the captain, you may have seen him before, uh, kind of knocked down a bit of it. It used to run all the way around here, but it was just some cheap stuff that you can get on Amazon. And then you can't see it over here, but I do have uh, a Series S, Xbox Series S, that I can now play games on, more games, Game Pass, and it's I can dedicate the processing time uh, of this computer to the actual streaming when I need to do it or recording or whatever so that's the hardware so the software then 
is obviously I mentioned Droid came into OBS. OBS I use for recording stuff like this primarily, but primarily for streaming. So I use OBS for streaming. Uh, OBS is very cool. I love it. I don't use Streamlab OBS because I understand it's not as good and it's kind of bloated and whatever. Uh, when I'm recording PC gaming footage, I'm using NVIDIA Shadow Play, which is just a utility that comes with the video card with the drivers and stuff like that. Uh, and it works great. You can set the bit rate, all that fun stuff. I had previously used the Xbox Gaming Bar, which comes native with Windows, but I noticed that it would start it would start aggregating audio issues. And you can hear that in some of the reviews from 2020, like Alan Wake. I think Deus Ex, but I think Alan Alan Wake and Max Payne uh, had the issues. You can kind of hear that cropping up from time to time. So I switched to Shadow Play as a result uh, of that. And then from the Xbox, I have an Elgato. It's the newest uh, HD60 Plus, so that I have as minimal lag between the console itself and then what's showing up in the computer that's streaming to, so that's easier for streaming and then recording, but primarily for streaming, that's the best application for that. So I use Google Docs uh, for all of my note-taking when I'm doing my essays. I create three documents. The first is the outline, which serves as the backbone of the entire review. The second is the catalog, which is the uh, file by file listing, or two five second increments, what is included in all of my footage. And I'll explain that more in a bit. And then I have a third document, which is the script itself, which is basically just a copy of the outline and then rewritten as the script. And I know it's controversial, uh, as a creative, but I have to say that I am firmly in the Adobe camp. I have been paying for a creative cloud for years. It is essential for me. I know there are alternatives. This is not me proselytizing. This is just I am in that sphere. I use those tools. They are absolutely 1000% worth it. And as I go through them, you'll kind of understand why uh, I do all those. It is there. Are, like I said, there are alternatives to each individual one, but the way that they just all kind of work together in Adobe through the different programs, it just it just works out so great for me. And I, I like the regular support and all that. So yes, I pay monthly for that, no problems. I have no issues whatsoever. So first off, I use Adobe Premiere Pro for editing. Uh, it's stable. It's got all the latest codecs. It supported the bridge, dynamic link bridge with After Effects is great and uh, the updates and, like I said, the stability. When I started editing 15 years ago, I was using Sony Vegas, uh, and that thing died all of the time, crashed all the time, corrupted files all the time, and I'm sure it's gotten better. It's not a Sony product anymore. Sony sold off their productivity software years and years and years ago, but when I moved to Premiere, everything just worked, and so I learned it for the very first nth review. The, the very first nth review for Watch Dogs was my first project with uh, Premiere Pro, and I've just been using it ever since. For design elements, I use Adobe Illustrator. Uh, that'll be like the bug in the corner. Uh, for stream layouts and stuff, that's all Illustrator. All of the static uh, elements uh, are in uh, Illustrator. I do those pretty much just slide by slide. Illustrative diagrams that show progression, I will literally just like turn off layers or change layers or whatever and then just fade into them with Premiere. It's super simple. Uh, I know it would be flashier with After Effects, uh, but that is just so much more time uh, to do those. Uh, I use Adobe Photoshop for the title cards that you'll see pop up in the middle of the screen when I want to emphasize something of the script. Uh, or just highlight something or it'll be up here or, or whatever. It's easy. Uh, I don't have to mess with the, the artboards of Illustrator. I've thought about moving them over to Illustrator. I just haven't made the migration, so maybe eventually just do that. I also use Photoshop to hide Easter eggs in the reviews that people haven't found, so maybe they will. We'll see. I use After Effects for chapter cards subchapter cards, all the animations that come with those, and then I also use it to build the jewel, which is that introductory piece that it's 40 to 50 seconds. Uh, that's the intro. Uh, I've been doing that ever since Max Payne. I've been using After Effects to build that jewel, uh, whereas previously I've just been doing it all in Premiere. I use Adobe Audition to record, mix, and edit the audio. 
uh, for all the voiceover stuff. I used to use Audacity. If you have Audacity, boom, just use Audacity. Whatever you have, just do it. Don't let any of this be a hurdle to working on your own stuff. So let's go over the eight steps. So step one is choosing the game, which will be its own process, I'll explain that. Step two is playing the game while starting the outline and recording all of the footage. Every minute I play, I get footage for. Step three is logging the footage and finalizing the outline. Step four is writing the script and then editing the script. Step five is doing the voiceover and then editing that voiceover. Who boy. Step six is all of the graphic design animation and laying the keel so that I know exactly how long the review is going to be before I start filling in all the details. That's also when I make the jewel and insert that and start showing that off to Patreon supporters. Wink, wink. Step seven is the actual video edit where I'm actually cutting in all of the footage and making the video, filling it out. And then step eight is releasing the video and all the fun little YouTube things that go along with it. Now it may seem, I mean, for me it seems logical. Uh, it's the process I've built across all of these these steps here. But when you take these eight steps and you really boil it down, it is four steps. It is choosing the subject. It is planning the script as I bang into the microphone. It is writing the script and then it's executing the script. That means you, you can apply the process to basically anything. If you just strip out the nth review specific stuff, don't you remember writing reports in school? Like the thing you didn't like? That's what I do. And I've weaponized it into such a way that I really enjoy it. And that's how it all comes together. So step one, choosing the subject, choosing the game. So broadly, what's your angle? You're saying you want to set out and make a video essay about something cool. What do you want to do? What is your angle? What are you going to bring specific? And this is a very interesting question when you don't have a process and you don't have a voice yet or you don't really know how you're going to express yourself in a long form essay. And so then it becomes, how do you make a video that's hours long? I mean, it may, it's, it's relatively easy to play a game or do something and then make a video that's 10 to 15 minutes long. You can get that done and edited in a couple days. But to take on a video essay that takes weeks and months to put together, that's something else entirely. So you have to be asking yourself, what in the world am I doing this on? What am I going to be dedicating the next couple months of my life to? And a lot of this changed because of Red Letter Media's uh, Plinket review of Star Wars Episode One, which was 90 minutes long, and you had to watch it in, I don't know, it was like four or five parts. And this, is, this was 2009. This wasn't that long ago, 13 years, I guess. But that was the one that, that was their break. That was the thing that got them through and basically made them who they are today. And so in the wake of that Plinket review, kind of everyone else has kind of glommed on to, hey, I can also make a really long video about something. And that's caused this kind of renaissance of quasi-documentary, quasi-professional commentary about basically anything, like what I'm doing here. And since you can put 12-hour reviews up on YouTube, the real limitation is how much time, money, and effort you want to put into a review like that. My 5-hour Thief review took half a year to do. And I know looking back, I could have done two other reviews in that time, but I learned so much from doing that review that that information, that knowledge, those processes that I had to come up with to make that real, I carried on through the other everything else that followed, like subchapters and switching to After Effects for a lot of stuff, even just arranging information. And we'll get more into that as well. And of course, with that longer runtime, you run into the temptation to perform a brute force or dictionary attack on your subject and that is you're just taking everything about a game and laying it out describing every single quest describing everything about the main story describing every single character and everything about them as if they were a wikipedia article and that's easy for a lot of people to do they can just sit there and just describe every single boss of a game they can just kind of flatly describe everything that is inside of a game and all of its contents and that is effective for a lot of people 
uh, not just creators, but viewers as well, who just kind of want to hear their favorite creator's uh, opinion about something and kind of relive the game level by level. And I'm certainly guilty of that. Thief had a lot of that. There are, I do story recaps in a lot of games as well. And it's not really something you can do in any other art form. I mean, you can review an album and go kind of long on that, but it's really hard to imagine any album review that goes longer than the actual album. And over the course of years, even from Thief, which was number 11, we're up to, we're up to number here, I've had to learn to kind of reel back from that because that's not what my intent was with the nth review. So then we go into my process, and that is why did I decide to go after the and create the nth review? The reason why I created the nth review is because I really grew to dislike professional game reviews because I really learned how they were put together. When I was growing up, I would read PC Gamer magazine and I would kind of take their final score percentages as scripture. And so I wouldn't buy a game or be, even be interested in the game in large part until I'd gotten the PC Gamer that reviewed the game, gave it a score, highs, lows, bottom line, and I love that. And then when I started working as a actual professional game reviewer for Fleshing Zipper, this was in 2013, the year before I started the nth review, it became increasingly clear that games were really not getting their fair shake professionally. You had these professional outlets that were getting a game a week or two maybe ahead of their release. They were binging these games and then vomiting out 1500 words and it made sense in terms of traffic that they would have these things out on day one. Day one traffic would come and it would be explosive and then traffic would fall off entirely and then no one was caring about that game at all. And that really didn't feel like very respectful of the game, didn't feel really respectful of even the reviewer or even the gamer, because then it distilled gaming reviews down to, well, what's the number? What's the number at the end? And so much discourse just became around the number. Even if there was still 1,500 words, you had 1,500 words after 16 binged hours to get to this thing that really was totally abstracted from the quality of the game. And it's not to say that other reviewers weren't doing that, but even in my time, when I would be doing these 35, 40 re minute reviews, and I'd be like, hey, go check this out. People would be like, I don't have 40 minutes to watch a review, a video review in 2014. And now obviously there are hours and hours and stuff like that. And in much the same way that those, you know, five, six, seven hour essayists will just spend their runtime describing every feature in the game, a lot of those professional game reviewers were describing the what of the game. I've said this over and over, and I thank Yahoo Silverman for really helping me distill this, really figure this out. It's not enough to just, well, for a lot of people it is. A lot of people it is enough to describe the what of a game. This has multiplayer. It has deathmatch. It has team deathmatch. The team deathmatch is good. The regular deathmatch is unbalanced and doesn't work. Uh, and these are really pithy observations. And then they kind of eventually, as you go through the game, as they're describing the game, they kind of eventually become a summary and an a judgment. That's what a lot of those reviews are. You're just describing your experience kind of flatly off the top of your head. And it's, again, it's not really doing the game much justice. It's not providing context for the game. That also increases this kind of divergence. The game gets a 6 meta score or 60 meta score, and some people really love it and some people really like it, but there's no context as to why people really like it or why people really don't like it. There's no subtlety in these reviews, and unfortunately people are trapped in this cycle. Even recently, there was a reviewer at IGN who was talking about they agreed to give her an extra week to review this 60-hour Pokemon game. And even then, when you have two and a half weeks to review a 60-hour Pokemon game, what justice are you doing that video game? while you're working on other reviews and other assignments. What justice are you giving that game? How are you being respected for your time and talent? And I'm not saying that every review needs to be this way. This is just what I chose to do. This was my inspiration to take my time and spend some time with each game and then release my verdict afterward, hence the nth review. I'm Nick. It may not be the first, but it is the end review. You've held out. Maybe you still care about this game. It's my review. It's what I thought after all that time. So my objective then being 
not just the what of the game, but the why and the how. I wanted to tie all of these things together. Like, kind of get inside the designer's head, even if it's like through conjecture, and you'll hear a lot of me. There's a lot of guesswork, which I hope is kind of logically grounded. I want to seek the how and the why of the game. And in the process, I'm exploring deeper issues or deeper things that elevate the game broadly. And so the, the reviews that I had that I was making that were 30 to 40 minutes long, I can now get to two to three hours and I don't plan them to be two to three hours. It's just when I'm exploring the games as they are, that's just how much I end up thinking about them and then need to convert into a script to turn into a video. They just end up being that long. It seems weird on the other side to then see like, oh, here's the, the next three hours of my life. But in my mind, as I'm making it, as I'm producing it, as even as I'm previewing it and watching it for review, the time just kind of disappears. This is just my brain dumped out on a subject. And that's the way that I approach these things. And then on top of that, especially with Thief, uh, going into System Shock as well, is covering a series of games and not just the individual titles. I know that covering individual titles is better for regular traffic, but I liked doing all four Thief games together. And in fact, if I hadn't done that, I probably wouldn't have given 2014 the leeway that I did if I hadn't immediately played 1, 2, and Deadly Shadows before then. And I think there's absolutely a perspective to be gained in evaluating all of these games, how they link together, what happened to the developer as this was happening, who, what talent was leaving, coming here, etc., etc., over the course of these games, who was working on it, who wasn't, which teams got up, how much time passed. I think those all add up and aggregate and they explain so many things and contextualize so much stuff. So that's part of like my secret sauce. That's also why I got rid of scoring. When I rebooted this channel two years ago, I also got rid of the numbered scores because the idea of putting 30, 40 minutes, an hour into a review and then just boiling down to it's a six out of 10, like that seemed stupid. And so as a result, when I make these reviews, I really feel like they're not padded out or not padded out as much. Uh, I really try to minimize just the rote recital of story bits or characters or what have you. I try to just encapsulate them and then quickly throw them into a, a think soup where I can process them in other ways. When these things get long, it's not because I'm trying to make them long for ad dollars, although that really helps. I am legitimately trying to do that in the exploration of this game or this series. So then we get to the fun part, the why, the picking the game. How do I know that number 17 is going to be Prey? How do I know that 16 is going to be Grand Theft Auto V or 10 is going to be Deus Ex? How do I know that? And that is a, uh, uh, that's tough. <laughs> For the first three years that the channel was up, uh, I only had 200 something subscribers. Uh, it took three years to get to 200 subscribers, 200 plus. Uh, then I took a two year break. I got married, took a two year break. And then I came back, and then it's just been kind of whoosh through the uh, through the roof so far uh, since then. And so when people look at my channel, they go, "Man, you've been around since 2014, but where were you those first couple of reviews?" And uh, that's a fantastic question that took a long time for me to figure out. So the first seven reviews: Watch Dogs, Forza Horizon. I'm doing this all by memory. I have it all. Destiny. Fallout 4, Just Cause 3, Quantum Break, and Deus Ex uh, Mankind Divided. Those were all then contemporary games. And I was kind of clout chasing, kind of trending chasing. Some people were like, hey, chase trends because then you have a chance of picking up. And so I would spend months on these games. Uh, Fallout 4, I had bought first day and I was unemployed. So I was just playing it straight and reviewing it as soon as I can. And despite that, only one, which was Destiny, ever got more than a thousand views. Most of them were like two, three hundred tops over years. Uh, I'm not kidding. Some of these reviews did not get very many views at all. And when you're a new reviewer who doesn't have clout, when you're a small YouTube channel who doesn't have any momentum or subscribers or anything, no one cares what you think about in your game. It doesn't even matter how long you're doing it for. Unless, I guess, you're doing it absurdly long, and then there's just kind of a comical side effect to that as well. Oh, you did a 
four hour review of Fallout 4. My Fallout 4 review was only like 45 minutes or something like that. That was a big that was a big deal. Those first seven, despite all the hours and hours and hours I put into them, uh, all the hours that came out of them, none of them hit, despite those games being contemporary to when they came out. Now, obviously, the review for Watch Dogs coming five months after the game released, when that game just evaporated, that should have been a sign. But also, I learned a lot from that. But when your Fallout 4, one of the most popular games of that year does not go anywhere after a f- after a couple months lingers at like 150 200 views that sucks so picking games sucks took two years off and it wasn't until six years in i should say that i found my niche and finding your niche in video essays is a really big deal because you don't want to have a video essay about the Mona Lisa in one hand and then the next one is about the Hoover Dam. I mean, it's it's possible, but it's not very likely that you'd find success with that. But I came back to it and I decided I wanted to start doing reviews again. Again, I was unemployed. I had plenty of time. I was doing weekly videos, which was the most miserable thing ever. And I wanted to do reviews again. So. Since I didn't have any money, I did reviews of games that I already owned. So I had Max Payne 1, 2, and 3, so I reviewed the entire trilogy. Boom. Done. Wasn't a big hit. Whatever. Uh, Alan Wake. I had, I bought American Nightmare. Boom. Alan Wake series. Was not a big, not a big deal. So then, right before I started work, I got Deus Ex out the door. And that one did a little bit better. And it wasn't until three weeks in that and I hadn't changed a thing at all but YouTube started sending tons of traffic to it I guess that's all relative but the channel just started to grow and by the end of the year I could I was monetized I had 1100 subscribers and it's just been kind of growing since I really didn't know that there was uh, a hunger for 20 year old PC games and immersive sims until I reviewed the best one really and so my channel has really become known as the immersive sim long form review channel and not me reviewing whatever new game has come out and so now even system shock has eclipsed deus ex so even though deus ex was my most popular video for a year and a half there are people now coming to my channel and deus ex is their second or third or fourth video that they watch after deus ex it's it's mind-blowing how that changes and it's nuts to me i thought deus ex would be the king forever deus ex is amazing and i don't want to just do immersive sims all day i don't want to be i mean that's my the niche in which i have found the most success but i I want to do stuff that is interesting to me as well and there's a balance there of course between commerce and art or doing something you need to do versus something you want to do and it's not that i don't enjoy doing system shock or Prey, or Deus Ex, it's that I also kind of want to do other stuff. So I did last year was kind of a grind, because uh, immediately after Thief, which also did pretty well, uh, I did Outer Worlds, which bombed out, which I thought would be pretty decently popular because the last DLC had come out. I did uh, City Skylines versus SimCity, which kind of did uh, but even Human Revolution, which was the second to last video of the year. Hmm, this was alright. Did okay. So you think you know what your audience wants, and then you release it, and then the crowd doesn't show up. And you'll notice uh, over time, like I've had to change titles and thumbnails. I'll get into that a little bit more later, but I've had to really be surprised by what's worked on my channel and what hasn't. And when I keep talking about luck and algorithmic lightning, that's what that is. It's you think you've got a sure hit and you don't know you can't predict what's going to happen you can only see what happened in retrospect and then create an, a, a bias around that so you know you may think that oh i got this in the bag and then you don't uh, and it sucks <laughs> so there's this balance between commerce and art where i would want to do more weirder games and do more j- just off the wall stuff but I know that the stuff that's really bringing in traffic more and more is stuff that's the 20, 25 year old immersive sims. Hence, I did Grand Theft Auto V, uh, which who knows? Maybe that'll blow up here soon anyway. It's the most popular debut of a game so or review so far. So we'll see. That's why 17 is Prey. So it's kind of a Soderbergh 
what works and then you know something that I want to do for fun. It also means intentionally setting aside games that I want to play for fun. Playing games for work kind of makes games miserable, or it can, and so I have to fight the, the temptation anytime that I get a new game or play a new game, especially with Game Pass, where I just want to hit record and then start a whole new outline and start a whole new review right there and then. Uh, I have to fight that and say, this game is a game I'm going to play for fun. I'm just going to enjoy them for the sake of what they are. So that's a, that's a work-life balance struggle right there. So then part two, playing the bloody game. Wow, how easy is that? It's actually, it's, it's nothing fancy. It's basically what everyone does. You just turn on your console, hit the recorder, or at least I do, uh, and just start playing the game. Pretty straightforward, and of course, obviously, uh, each game is going to be different. There are things I'm going to get stuck on. Uh, I might need help. Um, and other some games will take substantially longer to play than others because they're more or less stressful. We've talked about that with System Shock 2, with the original Thief. Uh, there are games I don't even play, like Dead Space, because I know they're just going to stress me the heck out. Uh, I'm not a completionist, but I do try to get all of the meat of the game, like the core content, and there are definitely going to be things that I miss. I don't do any new game plus unless it's critical to the game, which it hasn't been so far, but I've got a feeling that's gonna change here soon. Uh, I like reviewing games as originally designed, so I avoid mods almost entirely, and that made a game like uh, City Skylines harder to review because so much of the appeal of that game is not sticking with the vanilla game and adding functionality and mods and stuff like that because that's what the developers had intended. And so it then becomes subjective to what mods do you install and how do you modify the game. And so I avoid that entire argument by basically just not using mods whenever I can, which makes a case of City Skylines versus SimCity straight out of the box with nothing added, a very different story than what reality is for a lot of people. I record footage, all of it. As soon as I start playing a game, I hit record, all, you know, Alt-X with shadow play. I record every last bit of it. I am usually playing between one to three, maybe four hour sessions. It's easier if you cut them into two hour sessions in my experience with just the workload and the size of the files. I name them, the name of the game, and then a double letter uh, description. So AA through AZ, BA through BZ, on and on and up. I do this instead of numbers because it can get very confusing with numbers. And I haven't gone into the B series yet, but I've gotten close a few times. I've gotten to AY with Grand Theft Auto, I've gotten to AX or AV and, and some other ones. Uh, it's just easier for me to keep track of what footage is, is where and not have to deal with the timestamps. And in some games, especially if it's more narrative based or area based, uh, I will add uh, an extra descriptor like this. I was on this planet broadly. I did these missions, start of this mission, end of this mission. Uh, or whatever into the actual title. So then we have the outline, which I mentioned earlier is the backbone of the uh, t entire review. And I'm going to put some uh, uh, examples uh, up here. Even the ones for this video I did in a big, broad nine page eight outline. Uh, I got all my thoughts out. The biggest and broadest ideas come out as chapters. Uh, these are the trunks of the review, these break it up. Logically, uh, when I did my rage review way back in 2011, uh, it was presentation and then gameplay. But over time, uh, as I've played games, I've covered technology in its own section. I cover fear uh, in its own section. I try to get a little bit more abstract uh, about what the series is covering because it is relatively it, you, you're residing back in the area of the what when you're just listing off all of the weapons in a game. Which, again, I have done. When you're going back to listing just all of the missions in a game, again, something that I have done. So at the base chunks of the game, of the outline, I'm doing the most basic ideas. But over time, I'm filling in and adding more detail to the point where toward the end of the creation of the outline, I'm actually writing out lines that will eventually become the script. Uh, I'm getting going from less detail and broad to more far more specific about my ideas 
and just literally writing out the script. And the ideas that you will have while playing a game or something you already know are innumerable. You will think about so many things. You'll like, I like this gun. I like this car. I like this level. Uh, this character's really cool. What does this character do? What do what doesn't the game do with this particular theme? Uh, what have you. And enlisting ideas about games or levels or whatever, it would be so easy again to just list everything that I thought was interesting. But I learned not just from these reviews, but from when I shot Infinite Lives, the road to E3, a decade ago and edited it down that not everything that I thought was interesting, not everything that I happened was very interesting. And so the idea then is that you can strip out so much, you can leave out so much uh, of, a, of a subject that is not directly relevant to what you are trying to convey or describe. Because when you get out of the what mode of thinking and into the how and the why, you don't need to describe every single turn and nook and shake of a plot line or who's involved in what. What does that really do for a watcher or a reviewer? And again, there are plenty of successful essayists who spend 40 minutes of their hour-long review just describing what happens in a story that doesn't really add much to their verdict. It's just them describing it. Uh, some of my favorite essayists do that, but I'm trying to do what isn't uh, as common, as pretentious as that sounds. It's That's me carving out my niche. And it also follows that I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the graphics or the controls or how good the multiplayer is or the status of the game servers because there are a lot of things like that that aren't going to age well. And again, any reviewer can make a video in the first week of a game's release where they've crammed the game for 80 hours and say that this sucks because there are, the servers are up 0 out of 10. How well is that going to work in a year? It's not. And so I try to just leave that out entirely. My angle is that I add an extra layer of abstraction. Again, it's not about any individual component of the game. It's what those components add up to and become. It's guessing or conjecting why or how the game was made, how it was, and I'm only able to reach those ideas if I lay out all of my ideas and then think of them holistically. Uh, I start putting them together, the multiplayer with the single player, how these things come together, etc, 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 and thematically how that works. And I think that's what that's the juice of what puts me not just at the length, but the girth and the uh, brainstorming of the ideas uh, and how the review works is going beyond just listing stuff off and putting it together. The two plus two equals four bit instead of just two and two and four. I don't write any of the script while I'm working on the outline. Uh, as tempting as it is, I've definitely had plenty of daydreamy moments where I've concocted, you know, hundreds or thousands of words in my head and have even drafted tons of them. Uh, but what I found is that uh, I would wind up scrapping many of those words as I worked out the outline because then I reach a point in the outline where I know where the review is going, I know what my thoughts are becoming about a game or a series, and those thoughts that I was just daydreaming about are no longer relevant. And so now I don't even try to write any prose, any script beyond what goes into the outline. And the thing is, I'm constantly filling in this outline as I go, typically after I finish a gameplay session, so two, three, four hours paused it, I'm out of the game, I'm in docs, I'm adding notes, I'm placing stuff here and there, I'm coming up with new subjects and subheaders, uh, this goes in here, I want to talk about this now, I'm constantly doing that as I'm going, even when I'm at work, even where I'm somewhere else uh, and an idea strikes, I will pull out a post-it note, I will write down the idea, uh, you know, I'll take a photo of it, and then when I get back, I will just I will put it in the outline. I could just go into docs and do it that way, but it gets kind of messy in mobile, especially as your text gets uh, really long. Step three, we're logging the footage. So the game is played, and now it's time to log the footage. This means going through all of those hours of gameplay and describing what's in it uh, so that when I'm editing the video later on, uh, I know where that particular footage is, and I can just pluck it out and place it into the review makes it so much easier. The way that they used to do it in the oldest school was they would have the reviewer review the game, they would play it, review it, and then they would have someone else play through it again 
and just to capture footage of specific moments. So it makes it easier when I'm just recording every single thing I do as I play and try and be a little bit more thorough about it so that I have something to come back to. That helps a lot when I'm logging the footage. I'm not watching every single second of this footage. You know, you look at Outer Worlds, that was like 55 hours of footage. Uh, GTA 5, that was like 45 hours of footage. Thief was like 85, 80, 85 when everything was said and done, something like that. I'm skipping ahead in typically in 10 second intervals. Uh, and then I'm leaving notes to five second intervals. So it never happens at 1403, it's always 1405. That just makes it easier for me, uh, especially as I'm just trying to get uh, going. And I'm skimming back and forth and just kind of skip, skip, skip. Okay, this is interesting. Skip, 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 skip. And I do this in a three panel view. And so I'll have VLC player over on the right, playing and skipping ahead. In the top left, I'll have the outline. So I'm able to add in ideas. Uh, and I'll explain that in a second. And then in the left, bottom left, I'll have the actual log. And I'll start it and I'll name it exactly as I do the files, the name plus the double letter. And this just makes it easier to come back to. So the outline is there because as I watch the footage, I'll come up with new ideas. I'll have new evidence to support existing ideas, or I'll remember something in there that I swear was in there and then it isn't, and I have to uh, uh, I'll have I'll have to put it in because I thought I would remember it when I played it, and then when I came to script writing, uh, it turns out I didn't, so now I have to write it down. So when it comes to logging the footage, this is not typical. Uh, it may not be a process that anyone else follows. This isn't me describing what's going on in the game through flowery prose because that takes forever and doesn't actually help me uh, when it comes to uh, editing. So what I'll do is I'll use keywords. So for example, in the Grand Theft Auto 5 review, where I list stuff all the fictional counterparts to real cars, I'll put quote, car real, and then the name of the car in the footage into the, the catalog. So I see the Hummer, and it's car real Hummer or car real Pacer. And then I can control F later on and just search for car real and find all of my notes, find all of those vehicles. And if there's something I didn't note, uh, I don't put it in the script because I'm not gonna go back through the footage again later to find something I swear I had seen. I've lost so many hours editing videos trying to find half second snippets of footage that I swear I'd seen and now I can't find. There's nothing like spending 45 minutes to find 45 frames uh, of a game that you, s you swear was in there. I'll use keywords like cinematic uh, for cinematics or things that look cool. Uh, I'll use those to load up the chapter introductions. Uh, I, if someone does has a really cool quote, I'll write out the quote as close to uh, uh, verbatim as I can, and then I'll put quote and then the character name or the other way around. I'll use push for footage that I want to use in the duel, uh, on and on. And then there are times where I don't make enough keywords and I'll put something in the script uh, later on that I think happens more often than it actually does, or I uh, didn't document enough usage of, so then I can't find footage of it. So I try to be as diverse and use as many different keywords as possible. I can't predict everything sometimes I have to reuse footage and that's one thing another thing one thing and another thing is I don't I try not to use the same clip twice so in a three-hour review in which all virtually all of the footage is something that I generated I try not to use clips twice it's typically all original so I'm filling out this outline it's getting to I don't know 30 40 50 pages long I will put in all my sources I will do all my additional research in there i'll paste that in there i'll start building out my description box details and my little description box brief that goes into the studio when uploading the file and this includes all of the links to all of my supports the patreon discord etc and then i'll start filling in all my information my bibliography afterward and then the, i'll just have this massive outline ready to go all right so part four we're writing the script now this is the heavy lifting this is the big brain rendering the, this is the hardest part mentally 
maybe not as a task, that's probably the audio editing in a little bit. This is where all of the thoughts have to come together into a cohesive document because the entire review is then built on top of what I write. And so that also highlights the need for everything to be well and ordered uh, in the outline ahead of time. This is the part of the review that I wish I had a, a week off to work on because trying to accomplish anything else during this time uh, especially when I work other places 40 hours a week makes me really resentful of any moment uh, I'm not writing the script or dumping my brain because I'm just I'm trying to get this out of my head I'm trying to get it all out especially now as then as those uh, ideas are all coming to fruition I just want to get them out and so anything else just really irritates me so again I duplicate the outline and then I will start writing the preamble and then I will start replacing all of the individual little bullet points with the actual script and I'll just work down based on all of the ideas I have and if something else pops along as I'm writing the script which happens I will put that into the bullet points as I'm going or I'll just write it into the script uh, if I want to emphasize something with a visual title card I'll bold it uh, so when I'm surfing through the script in the graphics phase I just find the bolded portions and make those into title cards in one swoop. So bang, bang, bang. It just works. It can get repetitive at that point, sure, but that's how I do it. Uh, if there are bits I want to do, you know, a little comedy uh, here and there, this is where I start uh, inserting those uh, into the script. If there are, if there's footage that I want standalone that isn't me talking or me talking over it. Uh, I will make sure to have a clip for whatever, and that's usually highlighted in the catalog, wherever I need it. Uh, sometimes I don't use any, enough keywords, and that can be a pain to find again. But I will put those in parentheses within the script as well, so I'll know that. This is also the part where I reach out to friends or other YouTubers about providing uh, extra lines for bits and stuff like that. I ask for them here in that this first draft, because A, I'm probably not going to remove them in the second draft. Uh, and by the time I get to the editing portion of the video, they're already in my inbox or I've got a link to a drive or whatever, or if I need to, it hasn't happened yet, but if I need a pickup from them, I just need you to tweak something. I can, I have time and I can do that and it's not going to hold up the, uh, the process, even though this all takes weeks uh, at this point. Uh, these scripts now typically go between 20 and 60,000 words. Thief was about 58, 59,000 I think it was. Uh, when I started, they Watch Dogs I think was 6,000. And so based on how many words I get to, that can then reflect how long the review is going to be, which is something I update on social media or in the YouTube community tab, because I usually go about 10 to 12,000 words per hour between the voiceover, between clips I insert, between any animations and the duel and stuff like that. That's just kind of how it, roughly how it works out. So if I have a 30,000 word script, I know it's going to be uh, a bit less than three hours, roughly. When uh, the first draft of the script is done, I will put it on hold for a day just to mentally recoup from having to dump all that information. And then I will do one more full length re-edit uh, or just edit to make sure stuff down sounds right and rearrange a couple of things here and there, small stuff. I don't need to do anything major. Uh, or shake up the review at that point because I've already kind of locked that in weeks ago with the outline. Structurally, there's basically nothing that's going to happen between the uh, end of the outline and the edit of the script where I'm going to have to rip out tons of the script or anything drastic or rewrite much of it at all. It's mostly just cleaning it up, clarifying things, deleting stuff. I say things a lot of, I, I say a lot, say things, a lot of things say things. I can get very redundant where I will explain something once and then a couple sentences later explain it again with a little more context uh, and I know I do it and I don't know I've done it until I've done it. So I have to then be careful of that. I have a thing where I use a word twice or a variant of that word twice very quickly uh, from sentence to sentence and you may not ever notice but I notice it. Uh, I notice it. 
And this edit typically takes about a week. Sometimes it takes two weeks to make sure that everything is cool. Because, I mean, it's the length of a really short book uh, at that point. So to have to go through it, make sure everything's cool, that takes time. So now we're up to part five. This is the recording and editing the voiceover. This is both the fun part and the tedious part, kind of in one block here. Uh, I record it kind of basically in the situation that you see here. Uh, I don't have the camera on, but it'll be me uh, with the microphone just like this. I've got Google Docs over here. Um, it's at 125% size and I'm just reading off everything, basically paragraph after paragraph. I just scroll through, I'll get have another drink, which I actually totally need. And then over here in this monitor, I'll have Audition up, recording, making sure that I'm actually recording and good to go. Uh, I like to perform and act. Uh, I have, since I've been a kid, not in any official capacity except for this one, obviously. Uh, I talk a little bit in the System Shock review in the audio logs bit about the necessity to exercise diction and over enunciate words for clarity uh, but there's also the need to slow down uh, lots of people including myself uh, will rush through lines that I think I'm comfortable with and they won't be uh, as clear to listen to if I'm just kind of talking to them really fast and uh, that can get very distracting. And also it creates more mistakes. If you go really fast and you're trying to rush through lines, you will create more mistakes for yourself, which makes the edit afterward more of a nightmare. So if you slow down, if you don't stumble as much, you will make fewer mistakes and that will save you so much pain. So just slow down. If you think you're going too slow, you're going the right speed. <laughs> if you think you're over enunciating, you are enunciating just enough. So chill out. And I again, I like the performative aspects of it. And I people have left me plenty of feedback to that extent. Like they just like hearing me say things. They like hearing me uh, up and down. So if you're just kind of talking about the game like this, where in level one, the boss was really exciting, uh, but not very exciting at all, uh, then you can't really, you know, do anything with your Wander Blaster. And then you can't really move on to the second level. Uh, because you'd need the spells. And I don't like that because in 1993, John Romero said, I mean, that's not as enticing. You want, um, when you're doing VO, to inject a kind of excitement into it that you are in front of a judge and the only way that this game is going to be able to be prosecuted or set free is in your, basically, your testimony. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that if you take this video seriously, you could be a paralegal and then a lawyer within six months. Join the Nth Review legal program. I will teach you how to become a lawyer. And of course, as I'm recording this voiceover, this technically kind of becomes this third draft of the script because sometimes I'll write things that are fine to read as text, but not so great to read as a performance. Uh, so I'll have to go through and reword them in a way that I may have missed in the script edit earlier. The cool thing is that once I'm done with the voiceover uh, and the script has been edited properly, I can then just copy the entire script, save it as a text file, and then bring that over, and then that serves as the captions for the video, and YouTube has gotten very, very fast with uh, auto-generating timing for those. Uh, that's literally all I do, is I just copy the script over as a text file, and uh, and if you're uh, hard of hearing, uh, or if you just prefer having captions on, they will be accurate. Uh, there are ones off the cuff like this, obviously I'm not gonna have captions for that are not scripted or auto-generated, but for all of the mainline reviews for the essays, every single time, unless it's uh, included in the in clips. I, I'm a little lazy about including transcriptions from clips. Uh, I don't do that, so uh, getting there. I try to split my reviews in half, the, the voiceovers in half, so that I'm not getting raspy and nasty at the end of a really long recording session. With Thief, System Shock, and Grand Theft Auto, I split my sessions in half, or even in thirds with Thief. 
and I would edit that down as I was doing them, so then I wasn't having to edit all of the voiceover at once. So I'd have two and a half hour long session with System Shock, cut it down to an hour and a half, so I'm losing 45 minutes to an hour, just cut it out, and then I'm recording the next session of System Shock and then editing that, rather than record, record, edit, edit. So speaking of editing, editing voiceover sucks and I hate it. It's, it's the most tedious part of the entire process, I hate it. Uh, it is the second most mentally demanding process outside of the script, but for all the wrong reasons. It's necessary because it dictates the pace of the review and everything else is built into its timings and on top of it. So I'll record the voiceover exactly from the script. I'll put on D-reverb. I'll level out the uh, audio. So what typically happens is at the beginning of a recording session, I will be louder. But then toward the end, I just naturally get quieter and quieter, and I want to kind of level that out a bit gently. I also noticed that, uh, I didn't even include it in the outline here, I noticed that when I'm doing, when I'm speaking in sentences, I will start the sentence with a lot of power, but then as I am reaching the end, I'm losing steam. And you, sometimes you can't even hear those last couple words, losing steam. So I have intentionally developed a habit as I record record voiceover as I record voiceover where I will intentionally save enough breath or mentally save enough energy so that when I reach the end of a sentence I have enough to pop it back up again so sometimes I'll start a sentence but by the end I'll run out of steam and it kind of punctures it up and I think that really helps the flow of it rather than letting it just taper off like a basically a jigsaw uh, over the course of the voiceover. So that's something I had to learn myself. A little fun fact that you learned here first uh, on the uh, nth review. Uh, most of the editing is just cutting out gaps that are too long. That's primarily it. Uh, cutting out t extra takes that didn't work, getting rid of those, but primarily it's just cutting out gaps that are a little too long. I have a natural pace that I understand to how a video essay voiceover should sound like and how it should be paced. I cut out mouth sounds, clicks as best I can. Uh, I'm also pretty good now with noticing that if I say something weird, if I say a word wrong, I'll know or uh, that there's something like a cat meowing in the background, whoever that could be, a strange foreign cat. Uh, I'll know that I'll have to reread that line or that entire sentence again so when I reach the edit, I'm not going, ugh, oh, that happened, I have to go pull out the microphone again or set the microphone up again and say that line again. I basically, I rarely ever have to do pickups for voiceover because I just naturally know as I'm recording it that I just need to re-record that line. It's not good enough, just re-record it uh, and just get it done because that does save me time and hassle in the long run. All right, so now we're up to step six. Now that it's it's time to set up the actual video, I realize some people like to enjoy my videos as an audio experience, as a podcast, something you just kind of have over here, and you're over here, you know, you're over here, and you're like, oh, there's an interview going on, and that's totally cool, so long as you reach, the, you know, the last second, and like and subscribe, and, you know, visit the Patreon, all that fun stuff. But I do make a very concerted effort to make it something that's visually engaging as well. So something you could actually play in a movie theater and you wouldn't be visually bored by it. I make a really big deal out of it. So I'm not one of those reviewers, and you know who those are, where I'm just... <laughs> I'm playing voiceover and then I'm just playing a random five-minute segment of raw footage uh, on top of it. That is not who I am. Um, the average cut of footage that I make in these reviews is, is like 10 seconds long at most. So I'm constantly in there, sentence to sentence, providing context to what I am saying. And so there is a bit behind putting that together so that it's an audio and visual experience. And uh, if you enjoy it either way, no harm, no foul. That's cool. But if you're watching it, you're getting like 200% of the effect of the end review. So, hey. And if you want to be one of those people who just like plays random three hour, you know, raw footage on top of your voiceover, uh, more power to you, buddies. 
So I'm not going to get into the in-depth bits of what's going on here because that could be entire tutorials all its own and there are far better people that can do it. Uh, but I, what I will say is that I start each new review in the file sense, in the editing sense, by opening up the previous review and then saving it as a new one and then ripping, deleting all the old footage, pulling out all the old documents, basically cleaning house and removing all the association so it's not trying to pull a bunch of footage uh, that it doesn't need to do. Uh, which would suck up RAM or whatever in the worst case scenario. I do all of my own design uh, and with the exception of some footage that I have to pull from elsewhere, I do nearly all of my design in Illustrator. Back in the day with the earlier videos like Watch Dogs on to, wow, I guess basically Max Payne. So those first seven, uh, I was using Adobe Flash, which is now called Adobe Animate for all the graphic design bits. Uh, fun fact, the bug for the nth review, which is in the corner here, uh, that is the old logo, actually. It's a little bit wider. When I rebooted the channel two years ago, I made a slightly narrower logo, and I didn't want to change that bug out so that it looks, so if I was using old review footage, it would have like a little transparent gap on either side from using the old wider logo. So the logo that's in the corner there in the bug is actually the older logo. And uh, everything is grid based based on that logo, like when the subchapter markers over here. It's all just, it's all, it's all grid based, essentially. So fun fact for you. That was in Adobe Flash. So over the years, I took the static stuff and took that into Illustrator, learned Illustrator, started doing the static stuff in there. And I've got different artboards set up for different things that I need. Uh, and then for the motion stuff, I relearned After Effects because if you aren't using After Effects or really any program often enough, you will forget it and it sucks. And then you are just having to remember it yet again. I try to keep my design simple uh, straightforward. Um, there are people who do really elaborate animations or effects and I think there's a really firm trade-off in visual efficacy and, versus the amount of hours it takes to do really small things, uh, especially if people aren't actually watching the video. I like the visual minimalism because then it allows the footage to speak more. I mean, I love the, the, the right opinion uh, as much as anyone else. But sometimes, like just the overwhelming After Effects-y transitions and stuff like that, like that's mind-boggling. And I didn't realize that's an aesthetic that he has and his editors have. But with the interview, I just like keeping it nice and simple and to the point. Uh, this is also where I can mention the thumbnail. Uh, I don't actually do it this late in the process. I actually make the thumbnail for the next video before I even finish the previous video. And that's kind of a commitment by me for me that I will pursue that review next. Because if I make the thumbnail, then I'm obviously going to make the review, right? Uh, except for the times that I didn't. So, you know, whatever. So in this phase early on, this is where I make the title cards in Adobe Photoshop. Uh, but this is also where the, I make the chapter and subchapter animations from a file that I've already got in After Effects. Uh, again, I could do a whole other video about it, but basically all I have to do is just duplicate the base file where I do all of the fundamental changes and then change the text and the number for whatever chap subchapter that is or the number and text for the main chapter. And I'm done in like 20, 25 minutes tops. It doesn't take long at all. With the chapters, with the animated zooming bits, all I have to do is I will create the new image desaturated in Photoshop. Uh, all I have to do is just drag the new artwork into After Effects, control drag it over into the timeline, and it'll just replace the asset. I, it's so fast. It's so easy. If you're, if you're looking for like tutorials about how to do all this stuff, I assure you these are not elaborate animations either. Uh, they're just simple shapes moving across the screen. Uh, I don't even do the kitschy, like the pre-made After Effects logos with text animations where like you can have individual letters come in. I don't do any of that. 
I just move some stuff around. I put some eases on them so they kind of gradually start and stop, uh, which is a fundamental part of any animation anyway, you know, Disney's seven principles or what have you. And then I'll put some glows on them. So when like stuff's exploding, th those are just glows as well. And again, I like to keep these minimal and not distracting so that again, it's it's just helping the footage along really i'm just kind of hurting it's the cart under the big tv that's going into the tiny corvette that's what i'm at that's that's where i'm at here this is also the part where i make the jewel and this is like my favorite part of video to make visually uh it's less than a minute but it's the the cin that cinematic introduction at the beginning uh, that kind of tantalizes you, it lures you in. It's punchy and it's it's fun and I love setting it up early on in the edit because then I can show it off to Patreon supporters to watch while I'm building out the uh, rest of the uh, movie. And I what I'll do is I'll make the audio track with all the different quotes, so that's why I need the quotes in the uh, catalog. I pull those into Premiere, I've got them in a special, full, uh, special sequence. Uh, I will render that out with some uh, background music, what have you. I'll bring that into After Effects. I will build the entire introduction in After Effects and then render that and then bring that into Premiere. Uh, and that's how that works. And that'll go in the first chapter of that. So then I'm laying the keel. This is where I take all of the aspects of the video and I time it out, essentially end to end. I've got all my voiceover. Uh, the animations are done, the graphics are ready, the audio is prepped in time. So I'm just laying it out so that I know beginning to end where everything's at, how long it's going to be, and I'll be good to go. Because then all I have to do is just add in the meat. I'm laying out the skeleton, uh, essentially. Uh, this is also the point where I'll d record the outro bits uh, and any other fun stuff I'm doing. So, you know, I have the Patreon supporters on the side. That This is the point where I record that and put that in there so I know structurally where the uh the intro is going to be i that's where i set up all the intros for each chapter that's where i'm cutting in exactly where the uh voiceover is going to start or fade it in or whatever i'm going to do i set up all of that insert the clips etc it gets pretty tedious honestly uh because what i was doing and i just discovered a little trick here i was uh, laying out markers in time to basically whatever I needed to, which was typically the end of each sentence. So, reach the end of sentence, M, Mar leaves a marker. Next sentence, M, marker. Next sentence, M, marker. And this would take a week or two, especially on longer files. But I've just discovered a trick that apparently I can do all that in Audition when I'm cutting and doing the tedious work of doing the audio edit so that I don't need to do it all over again when I'm in Premiere. So I'm going to be doing that going forward, and I'm hoping that saves me like a couple days of labor. <laughs> Makes that a lot easier, because uh, it sucks. That part sucks. But now we get into part seven, and this is the actual video edit. Because with all this, with all the hard work I've done, laying out where stuff is at, with the, the markers in place, all the parts, the catalog I have describing where all the footage is, all I have to do now is just build it it's like a lego set i've got the instructions i've got the pieces i've got it i just have to do it it's basically the downhill slide i've sorted all the puzzle pieces and now all i have to do is just kind of search for one and then place it in there i've already got the outline of the frame so i'm just like kind of figuring out matching the box so this is kind of the part where i crunch i know crunch is bad in gaming but as someone who's trying to desperately grow his channel so i don't have to keep working the other jobs this is the part where i i'm rushing to get it out the door and it's the easiest part it's also fun for your dopamine uh getting those into your hippocampus getting those special brain chemicals going because you're literally seeing the video come together in front of you and you watch it over and over as it's being created in the earliest days i didn't use markers i was i had a voiceover track and i was just kind of placing stuff second to second minute to minute as i needed to that would make kind of just looking down the edits look and feel like a miserable experience but if i know what's ahead of me and i know how long it's going to take it gets a lot easier so there are lots of fun little things that i can talk about when it comes to editing there are tutorials everywhere i could say so much and i don't i would waste my time because i don't even know what you would want to know but i do have a few notes so each chapter i have a master in each project file i'll have a master sequence 
which will then be broken down into sequences. And then like the nth review bug actually goes on top of that at the top level of this master sequence instead of individually into each chapter. And that just makes it easier to manage here and there and stuff like that. And that makes it easier to manage the keel. So when I'm laying the keel, I'm, I know the, the shape of the, the review before I've really place too much footage in there end to end because it's all dictated by the voiceover essentially so wherever i can take advantage of a subsequence or uh, a, just another sequence within a sequence i do that and that comes from my habit of doing messing with movie clips in adobe flash back in the day when i cut video i will start the next clip on the frame before i start a line rather than as a line finishes so i don't have an awkward pause uh, before I start talking and the footage rolls. So right now I've got this clip that just started and right now I start it again. But if I do it the other way where I'm starting a clip after a pause, it just doesn't feel quite right. It doesn't make much sense. Uh, it feels like I'm kind of just lingering. There isn't much uh, tension, I guess, because if when a clip is finishing and there's just a little bit of a gap at the end, your mind can kind of fill it in. But if you're cutting to another clip, cutting to other footage, and you're just waiting there and no one's talking for basically 14 frames or 30 frames or whatever, it's kind of disorienting in my mind. So that's, I like cutting right as the audio starts. Audio starts here, blah, 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 and I'll cut it right there. You know what I mean, you know what I'm going. Uh, I mentioned it in the Patreon Q&A, but I like to cut footage so that I get to the action of the scene, which I've already been planning for, thanks to the catalog, into each sentence. Uh, I like to cut footage uh, like right after doors close and before, say, uh, a menu pops up or something that's going to be visually distracting. So I like to have it kind of self-encapsulated within each clip, uh, which is, again, it's it's hard to... It's hard to Depending on your editing style, it's hard to understand. I get it. Uh, it's hard for me to, to describe, but that's that's basically how I do it. I like to, like a macro, bent macaroni, an elbow macaroni, I like to have everything happen within that and make sure that nothing's happening on both ways. And one of my favorite tools in Premiere is you hit Y and you get the rolling footage feature where you can kind of scroll it, the clip backwards and forwards within the time frames that you have. So if something happens in the last two frames of a clip that you don't want to happen, you just roll it and they just disappear and hopefully you've got something on the other end that doesn't create a mess on that side. I hate phantom frames. I did a review about this a couple years ago and it's not a term that I've ever seen anyone use, but I see phantom frames all the time in popular YouTube uh, videos. It blows my mind. I just see these phantom frames. Uh, if you're not aware, because I'm the only one who uses this term, uh, uh, phantom frames are, they're like a loose, just couple frames at the beginning or ending of a clip that are cut, that are visually different than what happens before or afterwards, so it's very visually jarring. Uh, I'll, let me lay out some examples, like here's a clip of me driving and then a menu pops up, but because I didn't intentionally mean to include footage of that menu popping up, it looks weird. Uh, it looks like just a flash or something. This happens a lot with YouTubers who are relying on pre-edited content like movies or videos or trailers or something. They won't cut it uh, early or late enough. And so it's just very visually, just very distracting. And it is so easy to fix. All you have to do is just look at the work you're doing and pay attention. In Premiere, I have a special presets folder for effects and transitions, the stuff I use all the time. Some of them are the pre-baked ones, but some are just ones like color settings and that that I like using for different things. And these are great if I am gonna if I know I'm going to be using these effects for multiple clips in a scene. I don't have to keep going in there and manually changing all of the aspects. Uh, I'll also save positions, like when I'm doing side-by-side -side footage, like two video clips next to each other. Uh, I can easily set that up with just having a preset that makes it easy. I render at 1080p, uh, so even if the base footage is 4K or 1440 because this machine, the six-year-old machine, takes a good chunk of time to render a video as is. The biggest nightmare comes when you spend a lot of time rendering it and then it says, Media Encoder says that it fails. 
Uh, I, this happened a number of times with the Grand Theft Auto V, uh, so that required research. Uh, in this case, it need, I needed a driver updates and another reboot. I rebooted like two or three times. Sometimes the uh, fixes are more obscure and this and that, and it can suck when the file spends a whole day rendering like you're out at work and then come back and, and then it fails because that's one less day that you have where the video is out in the open. People are enjoying it. In my case, with my render profile, I have one pass VBR. At 1080p, a uh, 2.5 to 3 hour video will take me about 10 to 12 hours to render at a 12 megabit average bit rate. At 1080p, uh, with all the assets at full fidelity, like static screenshots and stuff, uh, so to make it all through there, and fail kind of sucks. I know that it could, I could probably render at a lesser quality and go faster, but I don't really want to. I think that's just kind of where I'm at. And I know that people sometimes do not use toggle the high resolution or high fidelity assets. And so when they are rendering video clips and they include screenshots of things, they look really chunky and nasty. That happened a couple times in Outer Worlds, I believe, or Thief. Something like that. One of those two, I had to figure it out because it just looked terrible. Uh, I name each video the nth review, the abbreviation of that name, and then an RC, which is with a number, which stands for release candidate. And this comes from uh, my time getting release candidates of Windows Vista. Uh, so this meant that, especially in the older days when I'd have much shorter reviews, that I'd have a rendered file. But then I'd watch it end to end, and if there were errors, I'd have to go back in, fix it, and then re-render it, and that would become Release Candidate 2. Uh, these days, with the experience I've had, and just the amount of reviews I've done at this point, I'm very attuned to what needs to get done while I'm in there, and making sure things look good in Premiere, so that when I export it, uh, I don't usually need a second Release Candidate or a re-render, unless I accidentally leave, like, half an hour blank at the end of a video, which I've done before. But even then, I can cut that down with the YouTube editor after uh, I've already uploaded it. So that's not as big a deal. All right, so now we have step eight, and that is the release. So now I have a final file. I have the thumbnail that I made a billion years ago before I was even finished with the last review. I hate how there's a two megabyte limit on thumbnails because these usually come out to two and a half or three or four megabytes out of Illustrator. And I don't know why you would have a limit like that if it's just gonna crunch it down anyway. Don't quite get that. I have to resize every single one and I don't remember until I've actually made it to the end of the video. I've already built out the copy that goes into the description box because I've already been used writing all that while I was working on the outline. So all I have to do is start uploading and copy and paste and insert all the stuff that I've already done. It's pretty simple to plug all that stuff in. It is unbearably slow to upload these massive 10 to 20 gigabyte files on my five megabyte upload, but that's what I got here in the residences of suburbia. Uh, I hate it because I've got 220 megabyte down and I would trade out like half of it just to get higher upload speeds, even though I only really use it once a month. Probably better for streaming too. I kind of wish that uh, there were like upload centers where you could just take a flash drive and upload at like gigabit speeds. I'd probably pay for that, but whatever. Uh, during this step, I set up the ads, I set up the keywords that don't really seem to matter anymore, vidIQ and Teletubby or Telebuddy are really trying to pimp you on uh, using their services because they've got friggin keywords or whatever uh, I think those services are kind of useless they just want your money don't use them or use them as an educational tool and then drop them while they're hot once I'm done with all that and I make all my updates uh, I get the link I don't even bother with the end screen stuff as much anymore with you know the stuff because no one makes it that far except for you know you loyal few you that are loyal to the nth review empire you're the ones who watch to the end with the end screen but once it's done and upload i send the link everywhere i start telling people about it etc the upload typically happens overnight so i don't usually start promoting until the next morning and then i can sit back and relax kind of like i'm doing right now not working at all not shooting a video anything like that <sighs> before i start working on something else <sighs> <sighs> So there are a few things um, that I've changed over the years. Obviously, I like tweaking things and changing things, kind of with each review. And some of that is actually pushed back from 
kind of non-performant videos or whatever uh, I used to name reviews as a series so each nth review would be the nth review number blank and then the title of the game which is much harder to get people to click on which is why each of the nth reviews has kind of a sensationalized title I don't like it but it's what people click on uh, it's just if that's the art I have to trade in that's what I'll have to do. I changed the thumbnails style entirely. I've still got all the old ones, but you can kind of see how they're different. I love how they look now. So uh, I'm sure I would get two, three, four percent more click through if I just changed my thumbnails to something different. But that's the art I want to keep if I don't get to keep my titles, and I will just hecking have to live with that. So whatever. Uh, from Deus Ex Human Revolution number 14 onward, if you're keeping track at home, uh, I started adding a cold open preamble talking about the game in question before I get to the duel, uh, which has actually helped drive average watch time, uh, surprisingly. The last video where I started straight with the duel was City Skylines and before that uh, The Outer Worlds, and my average watch time for those would be something like 17 to 19 minutes. And with the explosion in traffic and subscribers, uh, I'm getting up to 35, 40 minutes. But that's not necessarily a percentage of that because these videos are longer. So you can kind of you have to kind of take that with a grain of salt, uh, that, as it is with a lot of these things. Uh, I started imprinting the subchapter markers, starting with System Shock, so that people can keep track of where they're at regardless of the timeline. Because as soon as the subchapter animation ended, you kind of didn't know where you were at. I like having a consistent, like, you are here aspect to the review. It's something I've wanted to do for a very, very long time, and I've just only recently began implementing it. Like I said, I'm constantly trying to change things and tweak things, but never, like, too much because then that can be a lot of work for not really noticeable gains. It's just an attempt to grow the channel and just to make better videos and expand my skill set and uh, things like that. I don't have an exact rubric for what succeeded for me, much less for anyone else, really. So don't take this as scripture. Don't take these tips as scripture. These are just things that I found worked in my particular case. Every channel is going to be different, which is why you shouldn't compare yourself to other channels. What, Like, what's your CTR? What's your this? What's your that? It's like, it, that doesn't really mean as much. Uh, I've had my channel for three years. Do I have uh, enough subs? Is that a good pace? It doesn't matter. Everyone's different. I didn't have my first hundred subs for over a year. Uh, it was... Suck. <laughs> but you should be constantly experimenting. You should be constantly learning um, and trying something out. Never stay stuck in your lane. Always try and, and mix things up and learn and grow and... and, and just be make better art like just grow as a person anyway gee whiz if there's something i missed or there's something you'd like me to elaborate on drop it in the comments and i'll address it in the comments there or i'll do another video like this in the future to cover it if you want to see me editing actually in a raw format last year uh, i streamed me editing the first couple minutes of the outer worlds and so i'll put that in the description if i remember to do that but you can see me actually cutting in Premiere the, the footage. So you can kind of see how I do stuff with the markers and, and uh, stuff like that. And that's number 12 if you're playing at home. So I hope you found this useful. This has obviously gone long. My goodness. But with a lot of hard work and a little bit of luck. Definitely some luck involved there. Don't discredit the luck. I think you can be successful too. Or maybe you'll have the information you need to build your own framework to make your own successful video essays and maybe they're not three hours long maybe they're five hours long but hopefully they're not just you listing every single weapon in a game and how cool it is and the cons and other nonsense like that so like and subscribe all that other jazz go watch that last interview whatever that is that last one because you're probably watching this years from now in the future uh and uh peace thank you reviewers pew 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 pew, pew.